Dr. Ajit Amrasinghe. We can see it, sir. You can hear me, I suppose. Yes, we can yeah. see it. Okay. Yeah. So, Sat, um, so thank you uh, for inviting me uh, to deliver this lecture on allergy immunotherapy in childhood allergic disorders. <coughs> I'll be uh, discussing uh, this topic mainly based on my experience and the current practices that I'm doing. So just a brief uh, outline, what is allergy? Allergy is a, uh, is a reaction where the immune system reacts to an abnormal in a exergerant manner towards common substances. And this is caused by mainly caused by IgE antibodies. And the IgE, which, is produ which are produced in excessive amounts, would cause susceptible individuals to, individuals to have symptoms. So what are the <coughs> allergic symptoms that we call as allergic illnesses? Depends on the site of reaction. Uh, in the lungs, you can have bronchial asthma, wheezing. Nose, you can have allergic rhinitis or hay fever. Eyes, you can have allergic conjunctivitis, skin urticaria, eczema. Throat, you can have choking, tightness, I mean, in tissues, you can have angioedema, and in cystic uh, sense, you have, can have anaphylaxis, which is the severest form of uh, allergy. Now, these are the common inhalant allergens. They are dust mites, pets, cockroaches, fungi, house dust, and pollen. What are the common food allergies? There are eight common food items which should cause allergies. I think Dr. Nilika Malaviki mentioned about some of these. Milk, peanut, egg, free nuts, soya, fish, wheat, and selfish. And then I'll be, as I'll be talking about drug allergies, drugs are also an important cause of allergy. So what is allergen immunotherapy? <laughs> it is a process in which if a person is allergic to a substance, you introduce it in a calculated dose over a period of time. And this is done according to a predetermined protocol after selecting patients and is done in a safe environment. So what happens during allergen immunotherapy? Actually, nobody knows exactly what happens, but there are many theories. The most uh, common theory is that it induces a balance between Th1 cells and Th2 cells. Now, of the Th T helper cells, you have Th1 and Th2. Th2 uh, cells are the cells which would cause allergic reactions, whereas Th1 would actually have a protective mechanism. So Th, by inducing a balance between Th1 and Th2 cells, you can induce immunity or or, or, or desensitize a person to a particular allergy. So afterwards, what would happen is that the patient is able to get exposed to an environment where the allergen is, is there, or eat a drug or a drug, take a drug uh, or a, a food uh, for which the patient was allergic earlier. Now there are, <coughs> Uh, there are two types of immunotherapy we do at uh, my centers at Lung Hospitals and Allergy and Asthma Center Colombo. Uh, we do immunotherapy for dust mite allergy and we do food and drug desensitization for food and drug allergies. Now, uh, when it comes to uh, food and drug immunotherapy or uh, desensitization, uh, for the last two years, uh, about three years, we have done in uh, about 93 patients and uh, we have successfully desensitized uh, for uh, patients for paracetamol, penicillin, MSCIDs, theophylline, cephalosporin, metronidazole allergies. And when it comes to food, we have desensitized milk, tomato, beef, prawn, fish, cuttlefish, yinga, and wheat. And the cost of this treatment is 8,000 rupees. Because it's very important when it comes to uh, desensitization or immunotherapy that the patient is aware of the cost involved because yes, for certain kinds of immunotherapy is very expensive. Now, for example, dust mite immunotherapy that we do, uh, 
is quite expensive. Then there we are a repeated administration of allergen extract is, is done to introduce a state of immunological tolerance. This could be done in subcutaneous manner or sublingual. Now, in, in our centers, what we do is sublingual immunotherapy. The cost is very high because it's allergen made in Spain. Uh, the cost of three months of treatment is 93,000 rupees. That's about 31,000 rupees a month. And a year's cost is about 372. A thousand rupees. So it's very costly. So before entering an immunotherapy program, it's important that the patient is aware of the cost involved because if you start giving immunotherapy, it has to be done at least for a year of one year. Actually, it has to be done for two years. We are done in about 13 patients up to now. So what is the role? Uh, what is the what is the what is the uh, what is the current situation of uh, uh, importance of immunotherapy in asthma. It has been proven in many protocols and many uh, meta-analyses done that immunotherapy is effective in uh, asthma and respiratory allergies, but subject to various conditions such as the uh, usage of, uh, of other modalities of treatment before introducing immunotherapy. And also in, in a country like ours, the cost is also very important. I told you that we are doing uh, sublingual immunotherapy, but not subcutaneous immunotherapy. There are many reasons for that. Subcutaneous immunotherapy is, is very, uh, the, the, the immuno, immunogens are very difficult to transport because it has to be transported in, in cool boxes. Whereas sublingual immunotherapy is available, uh, which is stable in uh, natural uh, temperatures. So therefore, it could be imported to Sri Lanka. And also, sublingual immunotherapy is, is comparatively safer than subcutaneous immunotherapy. And also, sublingual immunotherapy could be done at home rather than coming into a doctor's center. So due to all these factors, I have selected to do sublingual immunotherapy in my patients. Uh, so you would like to know how uh, how to select patients for immunotherapy. Now, it's very important to know that all patients who, uh, who claim that they're allergic to uh, a particular drug or food or an inhalant item uh, should not be subjected to uh, immunotherapy unless you do uh, take a proper history, do examination and investigate. So why do we do this? This is done to determine whether there is a true allergy to determine whether it's actually IgE-mediated allergy because immunotherapy works only for IgE-mediated allergy, which is curable uh, with desensitization and also to determine how bad the allergic reaction was. So as I told you earlier, uh, if the diagnosis is correct, are the other cheaper management treatment options adequately and efficiently explored be before the patient is subjected to uh, immunotherapy and whether it is confirmed, uh, especially in dust mitology, and whether they can afford the full course of treatment. So when it comes to food or drug allergy, you need to know in the history and ask from the patient this particular uh, question, especially from the parent if the, if the patient is a child. Uh, how do you know that the patient is allergic and what were the symptoms, whether it was urticaria, swelling, vomiting, respiratory symptoms, mood change, anaphylaxis, or whether they have a hurting combination. And when it comes to food or drug allergy, it's important to know how rapid the onset, usually the food or drug allergy would happen within two hours of ingestion and how fast did it resolve? Typically it resolves in 24 hours, or sometimes you can have biphasic reactions. And what, when was the last reaction? These are also very important question because the parent would come and tell uh, in a patient who is 14 years old, when the child was one and a half years old, there was a reaction to a particular drug such as amoxicillin. And therefore, since then the patient has not taken any kind of medicines. And what were the other social symptoms? And how many times it happened? And also, also I think uh, 
uh, Professor Dr. Rajiv Disila mentioned about this, the augmenting factors. There are many augmenting factors for uh, allergies, such as fever, exercise, infections, other medications, menstruation and alcohol consumption. And also, it's important to know if a food allergy has happened, to which form of uh, preparation it happened. Now, recently I had a child who is not allergic to other weak wheat products, except for chapati. Now, so it's not so simple for that patient because his main staple food is chapati. So therefore, when you desensitize, it's important that you, you desensitize for chapati, not for wheat. Uh, so, in addition to that, whether in, if it is a drug, in which form, whether it was for a IV, oral or syrup, and also sometimes particular, for a particular brand. For example, paracetamol comes in different brands, and some children have allergies to certain brands that is due to probably the additives that are uh, made uh, put into the, these uh, syrup forms. Uh, so, therefore, you can simply ask the patient to another, take another brand rather than doing uh, allergen immunotherapy. And how much did you take? Now, for example, there are certain food items. If you take in small quantities, you will not get a reaction. But if the quantity is quite large, then the patient can have allergies. And you can do a physical examination to confirm that there is uh, allergic uh, uh, signs which are present. I think this was mentioned earlier. There are two types of, mainly two types of uh, investigation that you could do. Uh, to diagnose allergy, uh, serum specific IgE measurements, we hardly available for drugs to diagnose drug allergy. So therefore, uh, it's very important that when a patient comes and tells you uh, that there is a drug allergy, you must understand there are hardly any investigations available in Sri Lanka to diagnose uh, by measuring uh, blood, doing blood tests, uh, drug allergies. Then you can do skin testing. I think Professor Neely Kamalikige went into details of this type of testing. Uh, it is very important that you do a skin testing also. Uh, and also you can do uh, with commercial preparations as well as uh, what we call as prick to prick test where you uh, do uh, for a particular drug or food. But the gold, uh, gold standard in food or drug allergy diagnosis is go oral uh, food or drug allergy challenge. Uh, this has to be done by a specialist, so experts in food and drug allergy, and I, in a safe environment. I don't do that. So what I do is I actually do the desensitization process itself if I'm certain of a diagnosis, because it's quite safe to do the desensitization process rather than giving or introducing a, a, a food or a drug to a patient who uh, whom I diagnose as is having definitely a food or drug allergy. Uh, when it comes to uh, drug allergy, there are common false positive drug allergy diagnoses which are made. And sometimes people are off medications for years and years, sometimes decades, because the wrong diagnosis of drug allergy has been made. Now you can have an adverse drug reaction, which is diagnosed as uh, by your doctor as allergy, and the patient go on telling it's an allergy. Now, for example, amoxicillin can cause diarrhea. So diarrhea in amoxicillin. When you give amoxicillin, if, if diarrhea happens, you can't call it allergy. And you can have uh, specific reactions for drugs for specific infection, like for inf infection immunity. If you give uh, amoxicillin, you can you know, patient can have a rash. And viral exanthemas can cause uh, allergy. This is a very common misdiagnosis. So if a patient is given, for example, a penicillin or a cephalosporin while having a uh, viral infection and the rash occurs due to viral exanthema, the patient is misdiagnosed to have a particular allergy. And then you can have post-viral exanthemas uh, also, which are, which are not pure drug allergies. And then you can have other types of reactions. And also, when it comes to food allergies as well, you can have false positive food allergy diagnosis for uh, example, Acute infections can, diary, can cause diarrhea and abdominal pain, and it is sometimes diagnosed as food allergies. They are diagnosed as food allergies. Food aversion, or which can cause nausea, is also not an allergy. Viral exanthemas, which happen during ingestion of food, would be also diagnosed uh, as 
prominent uh, food allergies, post-viral exanthemas, and a family of history of food is also another misdiagnosis made. So the patient would come and tell you, uh, my, I am having, the patient's mother would come and tell you, I am having milk allergy, and therefore I feel that the child is also is allergic to milk, so I am not giving any milk products. And also there are wrong uh, social beliefs about food allergies, such as heaty foods, the uh, pineapples, vinegar, and tomatoes causing allergies. Uh, food allergies can cause very uh, uh, different type of uh, reactions as well as uh, it can cause failure to thrive because the patient is put off so many uh, food items, especially protein items. I think Dr. Professor Neil Kamalagi explained about this. And also uh, when a wrong diagnosis is made or uh, a patient is really allergic to a particular food or drug, it can cause the patient not to take essential medicine, which can cause many problems. Now, it's important that you diagnose uh, uh, that a particular person is having a particular a reaction actually due to a IgE type of allergy before uh, starting the desensitization process. Uh, I would not go into details of uh, this slide, but when it comes to food allergies, there are many types of food allergies. You can have IgE mediated and you can have non IgE mediated food allergies as well. Then you can have mixed reactions. And also you can have uh, non immune type of uh, allergies uh, such as uh, Tolerance to certain uh, intolerance to certain food items and also pharmacological effects of drug. And when it comes to drug allergies, also all types of drug allergies are not due to uh, you know, not due to IgE mediated uh, drug allergy. The food and drug desensitization process is, is quite old. It was the first reported case of drug desensitization done in 1942 uh, in a patient who needed penicillin. So uh, since then, the uh, since then drug and food desensitization uh, processes have been in uh, in place in many countries. So these are uh, many protocols which are adopted by in other countries for different types of uh, food and drug allergies. What we uh, do uh, in our centers uh, is a different type of an easier method of, uh, of uh, desensitization process. Where was, first what we do is calculate the first, the final dose which would have caused allergic reaction in a patient. For example, if a person or a child is allergic to milk, then by taking a, a thorough history, we determine to which amount the patient has shown a reaction. Then we take it as the final dose and dilations are made down to 10 to the power minus six. And out of these 18 solutions are made and they are put into uh, bottles in doubling doses, starting from the lowest dose up to the dose that we uh, we think that the patient would become allergic. And once these preparations are made, I will show you how the preparations are made. Uh, these 18 bottles are introduced to the patient over a period of 24 hours. If we do rush immunotherapy, where we think that the patient needs admission uh, to be in a safe environment to do immunotherapy, or it could be done at home uh, over six days. So per day you take three bottles uh, with breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and it is done over six days. So that kind of a slow immunotherapy is done in patients where the reaction uh, to a particular drug or food was not so severe. If the severe reactions happen, we always admit patients for one or two days. And after admission, uh, during the process of desensitization, the patient is continuously monitored with preparedness for uh, anaphylaxis management. And as I'm a pediatrician, when it's done in, uh, in adult patients, which we do quite frequently, uh, uh, which is done under supervision of a uh, physician as well. Uh, I, if a patient is allergic to IV drugs, then the similar kind of uh, 
of administration is is uh, is used but i have done only in about about one patient who is allergic to a particular IV drug but in that patient i first tried attempted the oral desensitization process so this is how uh, the preparations are done uh, for uh, drug and uh, food allergen immunotherapy so you need only a, a simple grinder and a sieve uh, so if the if the uh, if the drug is in, available in a syrup form it's very easy because then the dilutions are made from the syrup itself so you can see the bottles uh, 18 bottles uh, at the end of the dilution process we put in a box number and ask the patient to pay so these bottles could be taken at home over over a period of six days or could be given to the patient to be taken in the hospital every hour over a period of one day or over a period of two days so up to now we have done uh, this amount of uh, patients uh, from uh, 5th of november 2019 to 9 the 9th of this month uh, we have done in 93 patients successfully there were four failures so you can see in uh, children uh, we have done paracetamol in nine patients adult eight likewise penicillins nsaids theophylines uh, cephalosporins metronidazole now milk allergy we are successfully desensitized in 12 uh, children and also in three adults tomato beef prawn fish cuttlefish ginger and wheat uh, so there were four failures uh, one was, uh, uh, I, 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 I feel that the diagnosis is not correct. It was not an IgE-mediated allergy. Second case was where the patient was successfully desensitized for NSAIDs. And uh, the important, another important thing to do uh, while doing desensitization process is that, after doing the example is that, the patient has to take the particular medicine at least once a month to maintain the sensitivity to a particular drug. So this particular patient did not take the NCIDs for three months. So when he took for a pain after three months, he threw a reaction. That is the second instance. Other two reactions uh, instances were uh, in the hospital where uh, the patient developed anaphylaxis. Both had anaphylaxis earlier and both uh, drug anaphylactics, anaphylaxis. But uh, whereas I, after counseling, I advised them not to uh, undergo this type of treatment and everything was documented but whereas the patient was going for us both patients were going for surgeries they were uh, willing to do that but we had to stop the process because the patient developed anaphylaxis so therefore this is a process that we do now in Sri Lanka uh, and uh, it has been done successfully for last almost uh, three years uh, despite uh, the numbers being low during the COVID period uh, and also uh, the cost is very low but whereas it when it comes to dust mite immunotherapy we had to import uh, the allergens from abroad especially from Europe where good allergens are made and it is very costly so therefore it's very important that uh, you tell the patient the total cost before embarking on any kind of desensitization. And in all these instances, what is very important is uh, the patient selection, correctly diagnosing and also, uh, and also introducing the allergen in a proper manner. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Do Dr. Ajit Amarasinghe for that. Uh and presentation on allergen immunotherapy in children and sharing your experience with us. Uh, now the forum is open for questions and uh, before um, embarking on questions, is anybody interested in asking questions? We would. Until then, uh, there are a few questions posted online. So, uh, what is the current practice guidelines used in this allergen immunotherapy? I think what they're referring is to like the name of the guidelines, probably for you. Is that from me? Uh, yes, I think so, sir. Uh, they have not. Seen, so, uh, yeah. 
actually uh, internationally there are no fixed guidelines so different countries different centers have different guidelines but uh, the dose of 10 to the power minus 6 uh, from the dose a patient uh, would throw a, a reaction it has been mentioned in many uh, any main many, many centers so therefore i did the same i took the same i did the same thing but the the method of dilution and also introducing it is my own thing so there's no standard uh, immunization the, the standard desensitization process especially for food and drug allergies when it comes to immunotherapy also uh, immunotherapy uh, extracts uh, for especially for dust mites they are also not not uh, uh, not drugs which are fully registered in many countries even in europe uh, they are uh, like prescription drugs especially prescribed by people who are uh, who are trained in allergy so that is the situation none of these are uh, stand there is no standard uh, protocols uh, in this uh, in this in this uh, instance so therefore uh, you can have your own protocol but i mean I have been doing this for about last eight years, but I became confident in doing uh, drug and food food in desensitization only after five years of practice of uh, allergy. Thank you, sir. Uh, there's another question, I think, prob probably for Dr. Rajiva De Silva. Uh, so why not add uh, first-generation antihistamines in the first step of management of chronic urticaria? There's another question, I'll add that on to it as well. Uh, if you are giving if you are giving uh, montelukast uh, uh, lipotriene inhibitors, what is the duration of therapy? Yeah, the first thing is uh, you don't give first generation antihistamines because of the side effects, right? Somnolence and urinary problems and so on. So all guidelines would say second generation, except for. In, in infants, uh, the second generation antihistamines have been not recommended. That's number one. Secondly, um, all these drugs you have to monitor. So basically,